a Christian mystic of the 14th century, Julian of Norwich, lived during one of the worst centuries of human history, including the Black Death pandemic that wiped out millions of people, famines, floods, war, and corruption. In her writing, she addresses what she believed to be at the root of suffering, the misplaced idea of God's rejection. Without this core belief in beauty and sacred worth, we engage in self and other destroying behaviors, inducing further suffering. Contemplative practices invite us into union with the Divine One, healing the wounds of forgetfulness. Good morning. I'm Reverend Karen Gigax Rodriguez, and I welcome you to this online worship service from the Federated Church of Green Lake in Green Lake, Wisconsin. We have begun a summer series called Beguiled by Beauty, and the author of some of the material that we use is Dr. Wendy Farley. It's a beautiful reminder for us, and today we are going to be remembering that we are loved by God. That might be a given, we think, but not really, because when suffering comes into the world, we jump to a different track, and we start to think strange things. All of us have had in our lifetimes the small T traumas or the big T traumas, but these are not a result of God rejecting us. Rather, God promises to be with us and never leave us or forsake us. Today, we're, re we're going to be remembering the steadfast, enduring, unconditional love of God with the suffering that is true for us in our lives and in our world. Our scripture reading from the Psalms will reinforce this promise that God never abandons us, not even in the time of death. And as we have uh, begun this series, we are looking at beauty in contemplation in with contemplative ways. And today we're going to remember God's companionship with us as we contemplate God's love for us. And that that companionship show us a path to life and joy. Today is about suffering and the much deeper reality of God's companioning presence and love. So as we gaze with the awareness of being completely and unconditionally loved, we find our agency to be in the world in radically compassionate ways. So welcome 
to this service of acknowledging suffering and remembering God's companionship. As always, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you are welcome to chat with us while the YouTube premiere happens. And we love knowing who's worshiping with us. We love saying good morning to one another. We love uh, sharing our prayer joys and our prayer concerns with one another. And um, I always am joining with our group as well as this goes live. And I am taking note of prayer requests and sharing of gratitude. So thank you for being with us. I've put a lot of heart and soul into this service as I do with all of our services because you are very important to me and to our church and to our worshiping community. If we can mature in our own spiritual sense of being, if we can be mature in our faith, we are a gift to the world. And that's what I hope that we ponder as we worship today. So welcome, welcome. Again, I am Reverend Karen Gigax Rodriguez. I'm the pastor of the Federated Church. We always like to begin with gratitude, and I wonder what you're grateful for this morning. I would like to share a few things just to give us um, somebody's contributions, and I invite you to share any contributions, any gratitudes in the chat area. I do spiritual direction with a spiritual director almost once a month, and I'm very, very grateful because this person knows me, knows my ministry, is a mentor to me, and is able to help me discern uh, what God might be doing in my life and in my leadership. So I'm very grateful for that. And I got a chance to meet with her this past week. I'm grateful for my dancing oil lamps that I have here. They're made by June Kerner Wink. June was is the um, the widow of Walter Wink, but I just I have a number of her dancing oil flames, and I love them. And I love how they in, um, invite contemplation as we look at them. They're just beautiful to watch. And as I shared last week, grateful for a new roof that has been completed and put on our house. It took one week, and we're so very grateful for all the teachers and their sons who helped them um, put the roof on. So thanks, everybody. What are you grateful for this morning as we come to this time of worship? What things are bringing joy to your hearts? As we think about this, I'd invite us to share in this time of um, an affirmation of gratitude. Would you join with me? We always share this on Sundays. Lord, you are an abundant giver. There is nothing that I have that you have not given me. The way of your kingdom is the way of generosity. Help us to honor you with our resources. Free us from the deceit of riches. Lead us on the path of generosity. For your glory, Lord, for the abundance of our own lives, and for the sake of others. Amen. And we also take some time to share the requests that are on our hearts for prayer. And this morning, I bring these prayer requests to our attention, but I know that you will have some as well, and you can uh, feel free to, again, share those in the chat area this morning. We want to continue to pray for Judy, who continues to um, go through experimental, or not experimental, but um, very, very newly approved um, cancer therapy, and continue to pray for um, her cells and her body and how her body reacts to these newly programmed cells that will be um, soon introduced to her body. For all who are dealing with any kind of compromised immune system, for all those with cancer, for those with mental health disorders and diseases, as well as their families and the systems that are affected by this, for all those who are caregivers in any way, for anyone who's having an upcoming medical or surgical procedure, we pray for you. And this week is a special week in the life of our church. 
we are going to be having the privilege of um, hosting the installation service for the new General Secretary of the American Baptist Churches of the United States, USA. And uh, there'll be an invitation at the end of the service for you to take more information from, but we are so grateful and we want to pray for um, this opportunity and our new executive minister. So I wonder what prayer requests you might bring this morning as we pray together. And as we do so, I invite you to share those in our chat area. But let's share now in a moment of prayer. Most holy God, we are so very grateful that you companion us. And we ask today that um, as you hear our prayer requests, as we lift them up to you, that with every request we might remember that you walk with us in deep and abiding love and presence. And Lord, as we are able to know the assuredness of your presence with us, let us also companion one another with love. Not just tell one another with words, God's with you, but to be there as you would be there in love with anyone who's going through anything. And as we notice this, may we acknowledge you there and your deep and abiding love in any place of suffering, in any place of trauma. Lord, we gather these prayers together and prayers for our world, prayers for all suffering in all corners of the world. And we remember this prayer that you prayed on earth and that you taught us as your followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's scripture reading comes from Psalm 16, verses 7 through 11 from the Inclusive Bible. I praise Yahweh who guides me. Even at night, my heart teaches me. I'm always aware of your presence. You are right by my side and nothing can shake me. My heart is happy and my tongue sings for joy. I feel completely safe with you because you won't abandon me to the grave you won't let your loved ones see decay. You show me the path to life. Your presence fills me with joy. Beautiful things are always in your right hand. Yeah. 
Thank you, Praise Band. You couldn't see Elliot there, but Elliot was also playing on his um, bass, and Jan, of course, was playing at the piano. Thank you all. A Christian mystic of the 14th century, Julian of Norwich, <clears throat> lived during one of the worst centuries of human history that included the Black De Death pandemic that wiped out millions of people, and there were famines and floods and war, the Hundred Years' War, and corruption. And in her writing, she addressed what she believed to be at the root of suffering, even in the midst of all that going on. She said that the, what was at the root of suffering was the misplaced idea of God's rejection. Suffering is a part of being human. It's a part of living on this earth. But what makes suffering so soul-destroying, Norwich says, is our forgetfulness that God is with us. Without this core belief in beauty and sacred worth, we engage in self and other destroying behaviors, inducing further suffering. So contemplative practices invite us into union with the Divine One, and they help heal the wounds of our forgetfulness. I wonder if this sounds familiar to you, that suffering has touched our lives, and we think that we must have fallen out of grace with God. And we wonder, what can we do to win God's favor or blessing again? And we fear and believe that God is punishing us, that God is a punitive God, we think we can answer the why question and that that answer has something to do with us particularly and with some particular action that we've done on our part or haven't done on our part. And when the suffering doesn't go away, we struggle to think of ourselves as worthy or as lovable. We blame ourselves. It's a linear and worldly way of thinking that says God is the author of suffering and that we are sinners in the hand of this punitive, eternal authority. It's a cause and effect way of thinking, an if-then binary way of processing. We are suffering because we are sinners, and if we are sinners, then God rejects us. Does that sound familiar to you at all? Have you ever tried to figure out what you could do or be in order to alleviate the suffering and to go back into God's good graces? Recently, I was speaking with someone who asked me about my theology around communion. They thought I was too casual and not clear enough about the requirements one should have to receive communion. It's a viewpoint. It's a theological stance, but it's not... Um, it's not mine that we should have requirements to receive communion. In fact, I found myself saying when I was in conversation that in my 30 plus years of ordained ministry, I have come to be not casual, that's not what I'm doing, but intentional in offering complete space for God's grace. And that people don't have to be in a perfect place to receive Jesus' spiritual nourishment and poured out forgiveness. It was a stretch for me to be that revealing, I think, coming face to face with a theological position that is different than mine. And so after that conversation, I took a walk and I pondered it some more. And then I realized, as I was thinking about that last meal that Jesus had with his disciples and who he offered that meal to, that template of the communion that we use. You know who else was there taking communion with Jesus? Judas. And Jesus was not withholding it from him, even though he knew what Jesus would, I'm sorry, what Judas would set in motion. Isn't that amazing space for God's grace? And while 
we have put in place restrictions about who is in and who is out. Jesus' offer was to all of us who were th- all who were there at that meal, and by extension, all who will be there at that meal. The only request on Jesus' heart was that we remember. That's what he said. Remember me. Remember me. That we remember he came to show us that God loved us so much. That God came to be with us in the world, in the suffering, as well as the joy of our lives. So thinking that God rejects us or that God abandons us ever is simply not true. It's a lie. It's faulty spiritual thinking. Suffering is part of being human and part of what happens on earth. And we don't know why. But we do know that with faulty thinking, the root of suffering is a misplaced idea of God's rejection. And what makes it so soul-destroying is our forgetfulness that God really is with us. Jesus personally delivered the message to us that God is with us at all times, and at that Last Supper said, Remember me. Remember this. God is with us, as our series title says, because God is beguiled with us. God looks at us and says, Oh, you are good. Oh, you are loved. God is deeply in love with God's creation. Paul in the letter to Rome says that nothing can ever separate us from that love. And the message translation takes that chapter 8, verses 31 through 39, and says this, What do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would dare even to point a finger The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying, threats not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. Paul writes, I'm absolutely convinced that nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our Master, has embraced us all. So with suffering, with small t trauma, big t trauma as givens, we will have them in our lives. Contemplative spiritual practices are so very necessary to remember what's true about God's love for us, that there is nothing that can separate us from this love. When I was first aware of taking contemplation seriously as a necessary part of daily spiritual practices, and honestly not realizing that I had been doing it but didn't have a name for it as I was growing up, I was brought back to the image of a newborn gazing in the face of their parent. I had the privilege this past week of holding a two-week-old infant. It was glorious. She just gazed at her mom and her grandma. She just looked with complete trust at me. Having just come from the love of God, they're now seeing with their own eyes God's love in their parents' eyes. So as their eyes open and they look at their parents, what they're seeing is love. And what they're seeing is their parents. As we contemplate God's love for us, we need the time and space to gaze like an infant 
into what is beautiful and what is loving. A fixed focus and a spacious moment where we can say with Julian of Norwich in the whole big arc of all of life, and remember from where Julian wrote, from all the suffering that she knew and lived and heard, she wrote, the biggest arc is that all is well, and all is well, and all manner of being will be well. Present suffering cannot be compared to the ultimate chapter of God's divine love. And contemplative spiritual practices are so very necessary to know that love and to gaze upon that love. We talked about that some last week when we see beauty and we set our mind and our ego aside and just let that beauty remind us of the Creator's touch on the world, on our lives. But contemplative spirituality also needs to know what is necessary and true about suffering and God's warm presence wrapping us in companionship. We don't bracket suffering and pretend that it doesn't exist or compartmentalize it and then have joy and praise for now and suffering later. No, we come with everything as it is with all the suffering. When we remember that we aren't alone in our suffering, we are held in God's love. And it is the truth of that footprints poem that everyone loves so much that, you know, you see two sets of footprints and all of a sudden you only see one and the person says to God, God, where were you when it was the worst time in my life? I'm walking alone. And God says, no, no. In the worst time in your life, I was carrying you. Those are my footprints in your life. I've carried you through because I love you. We can't remember this unless we truly believe how loved we are and unless we know deeper than anything else that there is nothing we could do to negate God's love for us. And there's nothing that we did to bring on this suffering. So as an invitation to us, let us take as much time as we need to remember a time when we knew we were loved, when we had that infant capacity to know the presence of love and open our eyes and see love. I hope that we all have an accessible remembrance to times, plural, when we were loved. I hope we can bring them to mind. Real love, unconditional love, divine love. I will be bold to say, that the, there are these times in all of our lives to be found. Not to deny the deep and chronic and horrible suffering that might have visited some or that some might have lived through. Everyone has had in their lives, as I've said, both small T and big T trauma. I remember when my husband and I were dating and in tears he was describing the pain of divorce he likened it to an amputation without any anesthesia. But through the tears, he said the one thing that anchored him was he knew deeper than that pain was that he was loved by God. And from some place deeper than the pain, that truth was more true than his suffering and his pain. That truth allowed him to know in the end, all will be well. But this suffering should not lead us to forget that we are held in this deeper relationship of God's unending and steadfast love. In contemplation, we don't add something to a spiritual to-do list. We exist differently. We don't add something to a, a spiritual to-do list. We exist differently. We drop into a deeper relationship of remembering. Yes, we suffer, but never alone. The author of Ecclesiastes isn't being pessimistic as much as truthful when he comments on the toil and troubles of this life. A blessed life is not a life free of these things. It's not that kind of prosperity gospel life. A blessed life is one that remembers as the spirituals sing, through it all, 
Through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Do you know that beautiful, beautiful spiritual? Through it all. So maybe we know, maybe we know this from our own deep inner soul space where God dwells that we are loved. Maybe our love experiences have come by way of a beautiful sunset. Maybe we know we are loved by a truly good person who has demonstrated God's love for us. Maybe a teacher who has affirmed our true nature as gifted and loved by God. Maybe from a life partner. Maybe from a parent, hopefully from a parent. Maybe from a pet. Last year, when I was accompanying my brother through a heart transplant, there was a garden area on one of the floors of the hospital. And in the concrete jungle of Milwaukee City, there was this indoor-outdoor garden space where many came to remember God's abiding love with them during all that was going on in their personal health journeys. And one day it was announced that Hannah, the therapy dog, would be in the garden. Things weren't going well for my brother at the time, and I remember seeking out Hannah for some dog cuddles. Before COVID, Hannah could visit people in their rooms with permission, but now people had to seek Hannah out. I was a caregiver, needing some extra assurance of doggy love. But what I found was interesting, because not only were patients and their families coming out for the same thing, but nurses and doctors, worn by the suffering that surrounded them that never left that area, they sought to remember the deeper truth of love despite the suffering, and they would return better able to serve those in need. So a therapy dog can help us remember that no matter what suffering, we are loved, we are lovable. So where does our soul gaze? Where does our soul seek deep, true, divine love? Gaze and remember what our psalm speaks about today from this morning. The psalm says, I praise Yahweh who guides me. Even at night, my heart teaches me. I'm always aware of your presence. You are right by my side and nothing can shake me. My heart is happy and my tongue sings for joy. I feel completely safe with you because you won't abandon me to the grave. You won't let your loved one see decay. You will show me the path to life. Your presence fills me with joy. Beautiful things are always in your right hand. This kind of remembering, as the psalmist encourages us to remember, this kind of contemplative work transforms us and helps us be in the world in a very life-giving and loving way for others. We can look on others more easily as beloved of God. We can remember their true nature, even when they're not remembering it, even when they're not acting from it. The scriptures say, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the merciful Father and the God who gives every possible encouragement. God supports us in every hardship, so that we're able to come to the support of others in every hardship of theirs because of the encouragement that we ourselves receive from God. Let us remember and go into the world remembering from that deep place of love. Amen.
Just a few announcements as we end worship today. Um, we had our first Divine Dining of the summer last Tuesday, and it was a fun, fun time. So if you'd like to join us on Thursday, June 20th, from 12 to noon at Route 23, please just let us know you're coming so we can know what size table we want to get. As I mentioned earlier, we are hosting the installation service for the Reverend Dr. Gina Jacob Strain, the new General Secretary of American Baptist Churches USA on Thursday, June 13th at 7 p.m. This is going to be a fabulous worship service. You, good preaching, good music, a sense of uh, connection in mission to the world. And so uh, it, it'll just be one of those inspiring worship services. And I, if you're interested at all, you are most welcome to come and to join us for that service. As always, we are so very grateful for the financial support that helps our ministry continue. Um, summertime can be lighter and leaner times for us, so um, we're always grateful for that continuity of support. And these are the different ways that um, you can support the church through personal check through bank check, through electronic funds transfer, or using PayPal at our website. So as we conclude worship today, I would like to share with you uh, this benediction. And then we have the um, beautifully produced benediction piece from our Beguiled by Beauty uh, resources. So hear these words as we leave this time of worship. The world is so varied and beautiful. Seek wisdom wherever it is to be found. And may the goodness of the Creator, the companionship of the Christ, and the insight of the Spirit infuse your life now and always. Go in peace. Amen.